After an outbreak of a mystery disease associated with bats, you know, wait, I've heard this one. Humanity would be brought to its knees quickly, except this specific disease did not drop bodies or turn people into shambling infected. Instead, it would become a much more sinister form of infection that would offer immortality to those infected only as long as human blood could satiate the side effects. Shortly after the first few were infected, a mass outbreak of vampirism would cause human numbers to plummet and vampire numbers to rise exponentially through the roof. Ultimately, however, these vampires still had control of their mental faculties and and specifically the bloodsuckers in Congress, which isn't really too far from reality in general, would offer humanity the choice to rejoin society, but they would be forced to donate blood and really just be used as cattle. Humanity would ultimately reject this proposal, leading to the dissolving of the military and the reformation of it being the vampire army, whose only goal was to hunt down humans and then use them as a food source for the vampire planet. However, this immortality would come at a cost, and not just for humanity. Because the human brain was still largely present and in control, and so too were the worst qualities of people. People. Greed, avarice, aggression, after all, even vampires were still animals. This would lead to the human race numbers to continue to decrease as blood became more and more scarce, ultimately resulting in blood shortages that would lead to the rise of the subsiders. So in today's episode, we'll be covering the movie Daybreakers. Yes, I've been doing a lot of movies lately, but it's because I'm out of town and I don't have access to a normal computer or Xbox, so expect more gaming videos actually in the future. But for now, let's talk about what this disease is, how it infects the body, and how a cure was found in the most painful way possible. So as per usual, everyone knows what's up, likely. Up on screen, you will see a timestamp to jump to if you want to get into the science of this movie and how vampirism may affect the meat suit of those infected. But honestly, for a vampire movie, it was pretty interesting, mainly because of how it shows that really, they're not just mindless beasts, but organized quite well, and just completely run society, which made for actually a likely realistic take if everyone was infected quickly, and the hell things weren't called into action quick enough. You'll see what I mean here in a little bit. So feel free to watch the summary, because I always appreciate what you guys do. But anyhow, let's get to why probably since day one, the goal should have been to actually find a blood substitute, not when everything was just going to complete crap. So we start off our story with a jump scare of a bat, of course. A little girl is writing something down, and we see that it's April 2019, which is funny because that was the far-flung future and the far-flung past. Anyway, she goes outside, and we can see that the iris of her eyes have changed into an orange-gold hue. As she sits and waits for sunlight, we see her letter is actually a checking out one. She was apparently turned as a little girl, and then never ages past that point, and then just can't take it anymore. As sun light hits her, she bursts into flames quickly, ending her, as you might imagine, because she just turned into a pile of ash. We get some indicators that this outbreak is 10 years into the future. Society at large during the day is completely absent, but as night falls, traffic picks up, windows open, and while standing outside, the news is talking about how humans were offered a chance to rejoin society, but after refusing, they have become enemies of the state and will be regarded as cattle to be captured and farmed for their blood supply, which was probably the plan anyhow, they just kind of wanted to have the moral twist that makes the vamps feel better about themselves. As a homeless vamp watches, his eyes are beginning to turn red and he appears somewhat listless. He is holding a sign talking about how he's a starving vampire, let me play a sad tune on the world's smallest organ, and as a couple passes, he lashes out at them and he is quickly gotten a hold of by the vampire police. Meanwhile, our boy Ethan Hawke looks on at a bunch of kids smoking and drinking coffee. Judging by their age, they're actually probably supposed to be in their mid-twenties, but they're actually just kids, that sucks. Anyhow, society at large is about the same, people going to work for eternity, Uncle Vampire Sam pointing at you to join the vampire army and capture humans. People wondering why the subway train is taking too long. You know, the usual stuff. Oh, I also have to say, there are some supernatural elements to this movie that clearly cannot be explained in more corporeal terms, as you might guess. Like, they're sort of sticking with the no reflection in a mirror trope, so you have to bear with me on that one, but there are some clear biological things taking place in the meat suits of vamps that we will be discussing. Anyhow, turns out, Edward Dalton is a hematologist. Who would have guessed? A vampire is a hematologist. He's also a human sympathizer as he is turned against Against his will in the past, so he doesn't really, he's not really jazzed about being a vampire. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say likely most people were turned against their will, but he wants to get vampires off of human blood by finding a blood substitute so they no longer need to hunt people and instead can coexist in society. Though honestly, I wonder how long that would actually work, because again, they crave human blood, not blood substitutes. It's like eating vegetables to stay alive when really you just want a steak. As he walks in, we see the human farming area where people are being sucked dry for blood. That's a lot of pressure on the body to produce, so likely this would decrease a human lifespan significantly. If these vampires were smart, they would really just farm bone marrow from people and then utilize stem cells to kind of reproduce said bone marrow and create blood factories. But yeah, I guess keeping people as factories are just better. See, I just solved the entire blood crisis inside of two pages of writing. Anyways, a meeting is currently taking place. An inmate who was up for execution is being deprived of blood intentionally to see what the effects on his body would be. As the days pass, inside of two weeks, the body undergoes a transformation and becomes more and more bat-like and less and less 
less human. The body seems to be poisoning itself, turning the original vamp into a sub-vamp creature. As the dinosaur man, or Charles as he's known, the CEO of the company meets with Edward, he begins talking about his cancer. In his human life, he was infected and sees vampirism as a blessing that saved his life. His daughter, however, sees it as a curse and saw that he was a monster and then fled, which will be important later. He discusses with Edward about the blood substitute and he says it's not ready yet, but who cares? Because profits, am I right? We're not taking this thing back to formula. As Edward discusses with Christopher about the substitute, they mention how in apes it was going okay, but there were still issues. And that means that this vampirism is able to infect chimpanzees as well. Moving over to the observation room, we see that those issues are pretty detrimental. As they inject the blood substitute into a private for the vampire military, at first his body temperature begins to rise and then stabilize. As a nurse asks if he's okay, his body begins rejecting the substitute immediately. Looking like he's going to explode, they give him a counter to the substitute, and then he seems like he's going to be okay right up until he explodes, showing that the substitute's actually a giant failure, and the human hunting and harvesting will continue, much to the dismay of Edward. As he drives home, around the world, blood riots are continuing, and what's interesting is, mirrors won't show Edward, but cameras will pick up a vampire, which makes no sense, but hey, what are you gonna do? I didn't make the movie. He's messing with his ear, and as he continues to see what it is, he finds that his ear is becoming more subsider-esque, indicating that he has gone too long without human blood. As he continues to look, he almost runs his car into another car, which then crashes, and he gets out to check on them. When he does this, he finds out that they are human, and then takes a bolt to the arm from a crossbow. See? Van Helsing. Anyhow, sirens are going off as the police were alerted, to which Edward hides the humans in his car, and then turns on the daylight function so that the cops can't see inside his vehicle. He says that he thinks it was humans, though, and then points the cops down the road, saying they ran that way. The cops leave, and then the humans take off the other way. As Edward enters his home, we see more stuff about the subwalk, tunnels underground for vamps, and then it kind of gets a message that his home has been walked into. And then his brother comes over with a ball of 100% human blood. He gets it from the perks of being in the vampire army, but then Edward declines. They get into an argument over who hunts humans and who's trying to help them, and Edward ends up trying to pour the blood down the drain. His brother throws it against the wall and breaks it as a subsider exits the darkness. As they try to arm themselves, Frankie is knocked out, and this becomes a good old-fashioned CQC, close quarters combat. Frankie ends up cutting the creature multiple times as it jumps to the roof, but he's eventually able to get the better hand and beheads it with a knife. As a forensic pathologist shows up, she mentions how the extreme aggression is likely stemming from a lack of serotonin. They figure out that it was actually the gardener that this was this particular person, and they were feeding on themselves due to starvation. Later that day, as Edward is hiding in his house from the sun, the humans show back up, and Audrey then hands Edward a slip of paper, telling him to meet them there at high noon. The group that she is a part of is looking for vampires that they can trust for some reason. As Edward goes upstairs, he runs into Frankie, who asks who that was, and he says, really, no one, and then continues walking, and then Frankie becomes very sus of the whole situation. Christ, that was an old meme. As Edward meets with Charles, they talk kind of about the blood supply, and Edward is looking for a guarantee that after he creates his blood substitute, there will be no more human hunting. And in typical fashion, human greed is still present in vampires. Charles says it's important to let humans repopulate and that the blood substitute will be enough for the general population, but there are those with money and political power, friends and family, who will always want a taste of the real thing, and that the hunting will stop for a time, but it'll never truly end. Because if they don't cater to that market, someone else will. Technically right, but still a turbo douche move. This gives Edward the push that he needs to kind of go see what the humans are doing, considering that no matter what, humans are still going to be hunted. As he drives out there, he comes to a field in the middle of the day where Audrey is waiting on him. She directs him to a large tree where he gets out, which I still don't fully understand how he's not dying. I mean, isn't reflective light still a thing? <laughs> Though I do like how we can kind of see it from a vampire's perspective concerning light. Everything is lit up extremely bright with sunbeams visible in clear air. Pretty cool. Also, there's a uh, 1966 Mustang right around that tree, which uh, tragically will not make it out of the upcoming fight. And also, uh, you know it's a 1966 Mustang by the grill. A 1965 Mustang has the crossbars going across the grill, a 1966 Mustang does not. It only has the horse and corral. And this is where we meet Elvis. He talks to him about how trees are the oldest living thing on earth. Some can live up to 4,000 years, but will eventually die. And so will Edward. As they talk about how Elvis was a vamp once, Audrey gets got by the vampire military as Frankie has followed Edward out to the tree. It's a sting operation. Frankie gets pushed into the sunlight momentarily and then knocked out as the Humvees show up and light up the Mustang. Tragic. I mean, I really feel what Elvis was talking about here. Anyways, as a chase ensues, Holster are getting blasted into the car, letting in the light. Elvis is able to outrun the military, crossing a broken bridge, breaking it further as another Humvee tries to follow him to cross. But, okay, it literally goes through the cab, and I get, like, how it destroys the driver and passenger, but why does it explode? Well, why not? After driving several hours, they get to a place where Elvis says that he was changed back into a human. He then divulges about what happened. When the 
outbreak first happened, Elvis was retrofitting cars with daytime driving ability. As he was driving one of his vehicles, he had gone a while without blood and it was starting to mess with his head. He ended up crashing his car, getting ejected to the windshield, and then burning by the sun before ultimately landing in the water. He says it was extremely painful, but it restarted his heart and that they need to recreate those exact circumstances. Meanwhile, Mr. Tattletail Frankie over here tells on his brother like a total loser. Charles says if Edward returns immediately, he won't have charges brought up against him. But if he doesn't, the consequences will be dire. Back with Edward, as they drive along, Audrey gives him some blood so that he can keep his senses about him, and then he's also brought to the human compound. Edward asks if it's safe, and Elvis uses a reply that I will now use the rest of my life when talking about some sort of dangerous situation. He says being a human in a vampire world is about as safe as barebacking a $5 hooker, which beautifully sums up how screwed humanity is at this point. However, humanity does have vampires in its corner. The senator arguing earlier on the news is one that too is a human sympathizer, but not everyone is happy to have this many vamps in their midst. As Charles looks on at his crop of humans, they are becoming more and more scarce as people are getting sucked dry faster. Again, stem cells and bone marrow, but whatever. We get a quick shot of subsiders beginning to build up in the subway, kind of showing that people are changing as the blood prices soar, and that they are on the verge of their own epidemic caused by bats. And people do what people do at this point. Blood riots begin breaking out as people and workers begin devolving back into animalistic instincts. As Edward begins talking to Elvis about what it felt like, he says it felt like somebody kind of let the air back into the room and the sunlight felt like a bolt of lightning restarting his heart, to which Edward begins to think about how to recreate those exact conditions. He also gets some backstory on Edward. Frankie betrayed Edward and then turned him against his will. So yeah, Frankie is also a turbo douche. As Edward talks about kind of what happened, he sees that a fermentation tank is sitting in the corner and then he begins asking if it's airtight. They begin retrofitting it and then cutting it open to let light in to control the burn. Jumping over to a human caravan that is moving across the desert, they have a tire blowout and then flip on all their lights. Checking the tire, they see that a tranquilizer dart is the cause of the blowout, which means an attack is imminent. As they fire an explosive bolt into the darkness, they see the vampire military is launching a full attack on them. A short fight ensues and it's pretty much everyone getting tranquilized and a girl named Allison calls back to the group. Frankie then finds the radio and they track the signal. As everyone gets ready to bolt, Edward, Audrey, and Elvis stay behind to finish the experiment. Turns out Allison is Charles' daughter and Charles says he can't do anything for Allison's friend as she tries to escape and then Frankie knocks her out. Back in the fermentation tank, the experiment is conducting. Wrapping Edward in a wet towel, they let in the sunlight to keep him from burning entirely and also, you know, keeping cool to control the fire. It takes three times to get it done, but eventually they are able to restart his heart successfully as the military shows up to raid the place. They hide in a barrel with the now human Edward, and I just realized that he is a vampire named Edward. That's tragic. But regardless, the military is not able to find them and then moves on. After Charles was stabbed by his daughter, he's a little miffed about the whole situation, so much so in fact that he decides that the only recourse is to change his daughter. He asks Frankie to bite her, which, you know, he obliges, and then turns her in her cell. However, this will turn out to be a terrible idea later, which we will see. Back in the barrel, they all get out for the first time in 10 years as Edward walks into the sunlight, no longer needing to burst into flames. Him and Andre hold hands, which I'm not sure when that relationship happened. And Elvis then goes into a barn and finds a Pontiac Trans Am. Very nice. Meanwhile, Charles is walking through his human harvesting area and sees that more humans have been drunk dry and almost no one is left. As he goes to check on his daughter, the soldier informs him that she won't drink her blood rations. As he enters, he finds that she has been feeding on herself. He tells her that will poison her, but she's doing it intentionally. At this point, the subsider epidemic is in full swing. The military has been mobilized to capture blood-deprived citizens. So the blood is actually getting pretty low everywhere. Audrey, Elvis, and Edward pull up to the safe house to find that everyone who was evacuated was torn apart and eaten. And the human sympathizer senator has had his head torn off, so now they virtually have no one going to bat for humanity. As a subsider threat looms, the military decides to drag the blood-deprived citizens out into the streets slowly, like real psychopaths, to which Allison is one because she fed on herself. Wait a parent, Dad. I mean, why not just, you know, put them in a room and quickly open the roof? This just seems a little bizarre to do this, but regardless, everyone is calling for the extermination of the subsiders, forgetting that they too will be there in two short weeks if they get no blood. The deformities that are also exhibited are fairly interesting on these creatures, which we will also talk about. And also after seeing Allison, Frankie starts having second thoughts about being a mindless drone. A little late on the pickup there, bro. As Edward's group was lamenting the loss over the entire human group, he mentions who may be able to help them, his partner Christopher. As Chris is on his phone, he flips on his home's light to find them all standing there waiting for him. Chris begins talking to him about the substitute, but Edward talks about how they have a cure for vampirism, not just a way to stay going. As Chris goes to answer his supposed ex-wife, Audrey gets tranquilized and dragged off by soldiers. Elvis and Edward then make a run for it and escape through the tunnels, but are spotted. They head towards Elvis's shop and are attacked by a subsider. Frankie shows 
shows up to take the creature out as they have a standoff over what they should do seeing as Frankie has betrayed them already and also betrayed his own brother. Frankie goes on to say why he turned Edward and he's really oh I can't bear the thought of losing you Edward so I totally screwed you with an incurable disease that or that we thought was incurable. I mean it really doesn't make it right. They ask Frankie to help and this time he obliges but once again Frankie sucks. I mean Frankie's just doing too much so he ends up biting Elvis in the neck but this time he has an interesting reaction to it. Edward at this point knows where Audrey is. Edward goes and tells Charles that he will tell him how to repopulate the entire blood supply for humans and he will also give him the cure but Charles says he already has the blood substitution and it's never been about a cure. It's about repeat business which is ironic because Charles had cancer and there's this running theory out there that even though we as a species are trying to cure cancer some are skeptical that it may be really just about repeat business but seeing as this failed to turn Charles towards Edward's ploy he appeals to another sensibility reckless anger he calls Charles a coward for not turning his own daughter and instead having Frankie do it this rustles the jimmies of Charles and then he bites Edwards Charles realizes that he's been poisoned but he doesn't really know by what it turns out the cure is in the cured blood Charles is then cured of his vampirism as the vampire military moves in Charles has sent down an elevator and now that he is human and the military is starving he's ripped apart and eaten as Edward and Audrey then go downstairs Frankie bursts in and is surrounded he attempts to talk to his initial brothers in arms saying that there's a cure but realizing it's not gonna work he's just attacked and bitten but because he's been cured those soldiers are now cured then security grabs Audrey and a fight ensues which again supernatural element I know stabbing them causes them to explode in flames doesn't make any sense it just is what it is as the soldiers begin changing back into humans the other vampires begin attacking like animals despite knowing exactly what's gonna happen to them that's some thinking ahead and as Edward and Audrey walk out there's just a few soldiers left alive having been the last to feast they are now fully human Chris comes out and lights them up saying that there can't be a cure as he won't make any money but Elvis sends a bolt through his chest blowing him up Frankie is done but eh not a huge loss and there is a cure out there now as the sun rises and they take off in a classic car just gotta get your blood in the blood supply so the first thing I think to figuring out what is going on with the vampires and then their subsequent lesser form known as the subsiders is really it's important to figure out what sort of disease we are dealing with how it may be affecting the bodies leading to these type of symptoms throughout and why they may even need blood in the first place as well as how a possible cure is formed despite the methods being a little stranger than what may be normal now something again I have to stress is that there is clearly supernatural elements to this movie which sometimes there is really just no way around for instance vampires not showing up in a mirror right well if photons are not bouncing off a vampire and hitting a mirror and then being reflected into your eyes then a camera would not be capable of picking up a non-reflected photon either the only thing I could possibly see is maybe it's a heat sensing camera that then turns the heat image into a colorized image but even still I don't see this being the case in that car another thing to note is the destruction of the heart causing them to burst into flames likely that's not really a possibility or the complete destruction and turn into ash ending that they meet if they enter UV light again they're composed of cells that even if the cell bursts they would really just be more of a gelatinous liquid mess than a desiccated pile of ash so having acknowledged the supernatural aspect of these vampires sometimes it's just fun to go with a mixture of biology and supernatural because it's a freaking movie and it's supposed to be fun but even mixed with the supernatural it doesn't mean that there's not actually a lot of interesting things to learn about the possibilities of genetic influence concerning the disease and how it affects the body that said first things second I guess because I already said first thing is what this disease is and what are the effects on the body well it's clear to me that this isn't bacterial in nature nor is it a parasite based on how it's able to influence a person on a cellular level their bodies aren't actively fighting anything and instead they are just existing as is a snapshot of their age when they returned whether this is pre or post puberty freezing them in place for what appears to be all eternity so this is actually our good old friends that may be the reason for multicellular reproduction of life viruses okay I've mentioned this before but I think it's a really cool concept to extrapolate on and what I mean by the statement that I just said so this might sound familiar to some of you but again I just learned about this so when a virus enters a cell it's typically by unlocking entry to the cell via co-receptor once entry is gained into the cell in some cases the virus will drop its own DNA into your DNA where it becomes a part of you forever well after millions of years of bacteria getting shrecked by viruses it's possible that these genetic changes continue to accumulate ultimately culminating into cells invading other cells such as with sex cells such as a sperm entering an egg which now this part isn't confirmed but uh, we always assumed a major organelle of the cell known as the mitochondria was absorbed by a ancient cell but the virus hypothesis if it is to be correct it seems entirely possible to me that this may be a forcible entry by another cell and instead of disseminating its genetic material and then dissolving the cell continued to live on which again we know as with the mitochondria it was an ancient bacteria 
bacteria because it has its own DNA. Again, that's just my thinking on it. I'm not sure if that's in a paper or not, so take it with a grain of salt. But anyhow, so we may have viruses to thank for multicellular life in some ways, but it's a relatively new line of thinking. So I believe vampirism itself is in fact a virus that stemmed from bats. Coming from bats, because as clearly shown, bats appear to be the vector used to spread the virus through bites. But in my mind, it has to be a virus based on what it does to the body. And also being a virus innately capable of interacting with both bats and humans, which would make it a mammalian based virus. Another thing that could help us understand why bats were the chosen vector is something that's shown in real life. Bats have a lot of viruses that infect them. The reason they don't drop like humans do is because of how their bodies operate in the presence of viruses. Whereas human immune systems, more so with the current virus on this planet that we are contending with, may cause an overactive inflammation response or interferon production is slashed, causing the body to not release enzymes that break up viral genetic material. Bats don't struggle with this. Some bats have been shown to consistently release interferon even when they're not under attack from anything because this primes the cells for a viral invasion. In other ways, inflammation is subdued tremendously in bats, more so than other animals, and this allows them to survive what might otherwise be lethal. This would mean that when infected with vampirism, the bats may have no issue destroying the virus within their own bodies. But when it jumped to humans, the virus was able to spread and affect the bodies of Homo sapiens in which would appear to be beneficial ways, but also massively detrimental. After a human was bitten by a bat containing the vampirism virus, it would enter the body quickly through the wound on the neck, arm, trapezius muscle, wherever they were bitten. And this may hint that you know where this was going. Maybe a form of mutated rabies, but something similar as it spreads through the salivary glands. However, just because it's a shared trait does not necessarily mean it's rabies, but you know, it could possibly be rabies. Viruses form similar pathways of infection all the time, as those are the successful ones. Once in the body, as with Allison, we can see that it must enter the bloodstream at first to get around the body, which considering it just got into the neck area, a lot of blood is there. It seems at this point that it will move around the body of a person with a fast acting infection rate, quickly outclassing the ability of the immune system to respond to it. At first, macrophages would be quickly overwhelmed as the virus replicated inside of cells, possibly with nothing saying that it's being infected, and this may be the interferon suppression ability. Again, interferons are important in a cell, telling the rest of the body that it's under attack, and this may be the first clear indicator that a genetic profile of the person is being tampered with as the interferon production would not take place, meaning no cell would basically be yelling for help. And the reason the virus would be apt to do this is because it's still very much so susceptible to the effects of antibodies in the immune system at large, which we will talk about later with maybe a different timeline. But the next place to hit to stop the body from forming an effective resistance would be the bloodstream. The bloodstream is where pretty much all countermeasures are passing through, sort of like the highway system in a country. Clog up the highway, stop the system. The heart would be stopped in a person, but they would still be alive, which comes to an interesting hurdle, but I'll do my best to explain it. We know Edward tells the private to just breathe after his injection, despite the fact that no oxygen is being sent via the bloodstream around the body as the heart is no longer beating. But it would appear that the person is still breathing or they're being told to breathe. Now, this might be for one or two reasons. If the brain is still monitoring the body through chemoreceptors on the brainstem, then something in that area must be keeping the body alive and saying just breathe may be more of a soothing technique for the body from a bygone era, meaning that vampires don't actually have to breathe. This would mean that the metabolism has switched over to an anaerobic metabolism, meaning that it is able to function without oxygen to a degree which is possible in humans, but is incredibly wasteful concerning ATP production, as it's not the preferred method of making energy, as it produces much less available energy for the cell. So you cannot survive without oxygen. You need oxygen to actually do this. But there are anaerobic bacteria that can do this completely without oxygen. So the other and less likely option is that the vampires do still need oxygen, but it's more of a diffusing type of deal. However, diffusion through a body like this would be more in line with insects. And as you might notice, we don't really have human sized insects running around as the oxygen saturation levels would tank just outside the lung tissue as nothing is moving oxygen around the body. As such, the possibility is highly unlikely to be viable for any animal. And this tells me that vampires must have anaerobic metabolisms at their disposal. And this will be backed up when Edward is in the chamber attempting to turn back into human. Elvis has to have oxygen over his mouth to continue breathing and keeping his levels up, whereas Edward is given no oxygen to supplement, meaning that it really may not be necessary for him to do so. Although maybe giving a man who catches on fire oxygen, not a good plan. It could go either way. So the question is, how might this adaptation have come about so quickly? Well, it's clear to me that given the time it takes for the virus to enter the body and infect human cells, it's not just looking for human DNA, which we will cover here in a second. It's looking for cellular DNA. It appears that given the time mitochondria has spent within humans' bodies, 
considering they respond to the same cues as the rest of the cell, like say the division of the cell, the virus may have entered the very DNA of the mitochondria, altering it, changing its metabolism to one that is only anaerobic behavior rather than being able to carry out both. This injection of genetic material may make the process more efficient overall, allowing it to continue to power the cell despite the lack of oxygen. Concerning human genetic information, our DNA would not be spared from the infection to say the least, as gene expression may be the problem. Considering there is a snapshot of who you were the day you were bitten and you never appear over or under that age, you just appear at that age, my line of thinking on this is that it would have to be a exonuclease activity of DNA polymerase. Essentially, when you have genetic damage, like from aging brought on by errors during replication, the body will proofread the DNA and attempt to repair it. And this is what keeps you alive for as long as you are, as the basis of our genetic code is fixed and repaired all the time. In fact, the second you walk out into the sun, you are receiving genetic damage to which the body attempts to fix. Now, this DNA polymerase, or at least human DNA polymerase, uh, the really all animal DNA polymerase, except I believe maybe lobsters and a type of jellyfish, if I remember correctly. Theirs are perfect, ours are not perfect. Mistakes happen, sometimes a repair just isn't possible, and really, unless a cell undergoes apoptosis or becomes cancer, those are really the only two options if it just cannot fix the DNA. Also during replication, we age as issues arise. Every cell is hypothesized to divide around 60 times before it finally reaches the end of its ability, the damage becomes too great. And again, this leads to the aging process and the eventual breakdown of our bodies. It sucks, but that's the name of the game currently until we figure out CRISPR kind of to a better degree and then we can fix our genetic code manually. But with this virus, I believe what is happening is the cell would have a much better form of this corrective polymerase, something that is 100% or near 100% capable of fixing genes. Potentially like a snapshot of all of your DNA coding are taken and stored by some unknown enzyme. And that is used as a permanent template correcting issues within the body, allowing the person to seemingly live forever. Although 10 years may seem like a long time with a polymerase that is 99.9999999% effective at correcting errors, 10 years to a human may be equivalent to just a few days to a vampire in terms of lifespan, meaning they aren't immortal, they're just aging extremely slowly, but that's just my hypothesis on that. But this template may actually be the Achilles heel of vampires because the next thing that may explain why they need to suck blood from humans kind of derails this entire glass cannon scenario. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to nutrition. Despite the anaerobic metabolism of the body brought on by viral intervention, which has infected every cell, whether it be muscular, epithelial, nervous, or osseous, they are still technically alive and need nutrition. And because they need nutrition, that means their bodies have requirements that must be met or they will devolve into chaos like any other body, which ultimately means death. I believe the critical missing component for these vampires and their undoing of a species is something as simple as a complete and utter lack of vitamin D. It really is that simple because of the critical role of this particular vitamin and how it plays in cellular function. Now, before you say, Roanoke, why wouldn't they just take a multivitamin then? Well, I would ask you why they just wouldn't harvest bone marrow again and then use stem cells to create a massive blood bank that produces more blood and harvesting humans is incredibly inefficient after all because then you just kind of accumulate the blood that they only produce and it doesn't, I mean, it takes a while and I am no way a vampire overlord figuring out the best way to get blood from humans. That'd be crazy. But moving on, it's also possible that there are other components in the human blood that allow for the survival of the vampire, such as other nutrients and cells that can be broken down for sustenance. But let's take a look at what vitamin D deficiency actually does to a person because it's pretty detrimental. And it also kind of explains why their heart stops. Starting off first to hit them where it hurts with vampires and then also explains the subsiders and what the forensic pathologist said, vitamin D is crucial to genetic damage repair. When a body is low on vitamin D consistently, the body has an extremely tough time actually repairing genetic damage accumulated through replication and just being alive. And this means all things spawned by genetic damage, if it happens to be in a crucial gene, may have had their start in the absence of this vitamin. So remember, it is important to take care of your body. With the vampires, this vitamin is replenished in their own body by the consumption of blood. Now digestion, as we know it, requires an active circulatory system, so this vitamin must be moving through the body by some other method, allowing the cell to utilize these vitamin resources to maintain genetic integrity. The new hypothesized enzyme that the virus has created using the cells to build by injecting its own genes into the DNA would no doubt need vitamin D to continue to repair the DNA of the vampire. But as the blood shortage continued and vampires could no longer afford to get the blood, their bodies would begin having genetic damage accumulate within their cells. As they begin to feed on themselves, what's interesting is it poisons them quicker. Their changes rapidly become more apparent than just the standard starvation from lack of blood. So you might ask yourself, why? Well, I think 
this might be an issue of double infection, actually. With the blood stagnant in the body and the rest of the body still interacting with itself, it's possible two forms of the virus may exist. The blood being an older, more dormant form, and the virus of the person is infected with now having changed because of the interaction with the cells. Upon feeding on themselves, they get exposed to the old virus, which also enters the cell and may try to carry on the same pathway as the original infection did, but now you have possibly two templates forming within the body, accelerating the genetic confrontation for which genes are expressed within the body. This doubling up of an almost staggered amount of time would mean deformities would begin to run rampant, which is what we have seen to those dragged in the sunlight because of literally a genetic battle as the cell attempts to correct possibly changes to the DNA, and then those changes are corrected with other changes, which then changed to no more changes, and then just so on and so forth until you have this runaway effect of issues. Those who do not feed on themselves, however, will still suffer the same fate, just at a slower rate. As the vitamin D deficiency continues, changes in the coding aren't corrected. This new enzyme may be an all or nothing enzyme and completely stops at a certain level of vitamin D deficiency as the damages to the DNA quickly mount up and begin forming first in the epithelial layer, such as with the skin, which we have seen in Edward's ears. What is fascinating concerning not only Edward's ears, but the subsiders is the formation that they devolve into. It would almost appear that the virus holds on to possible past templates as it appears to be an amalgamation of human and bat DNA. Possibly because it originated in bats, this would be the most familiar genetic coding. Then, after jumping to Homo sapiens, without genetic correction, the virus may apply this old, more prominent template, or even remaining one, which inspires the bat-like characteristics, such as the formation of wings and a pointed face. It's not like protrusions and elongated feet with claws. So, it's just important to note that vitamin D, along with many other vitamins, are also responsible for maintaining aid to enzymes and fixing genetic damage, but vitamin D also has another function, which is directly mentioned by the forensic pathologist. She mentions how the subsider attacks due to an extreme lack of serotonin, causing aggression in them. Vitamin D deficiency is also linked to incorrect serotonin reuptake in the synapses of a neuron, and also linked to depression in humans. But what's most interesting about serotonin, which relates directly to these vampires, is serotonin actually affects the mammalian heart. It increases heart rate, increases force and contraction, coronary constriction, just in general how your heart actually beats. So if you have an extreme deficiency, it can lead to heart palpitations and arrhythmias, which ultimately can cause your heart to stop. But that's an extreme lack of serotonin. But moving back to the mental issues, this is why seasonal affective disorder is a very real thing as people feel depressed in late fall to early spring as the sun is not out as much and they may be inside during the day where they cannot receive vitamin D. So as this continues to mount, the depression would worsen and the aggression will continue to increase, which again, the subsiders will attack at anything near them, whether it be human or vampire, though human blood is preferred. All this pointing to vitamin D still gives us why vampires may lack this critical nutrient the most, however, because vitamin D is created for free by your skin when it comes into contact with sunlight. Considering that vampires burst into flames if they come into contact with UV radiation or direct sunlight, it's clear their bodies would be lacking this nutrient to a whole different level. But the irony may be the virus has this critical dependency on this nutrient and without it, cellular functions begin to rapidly decay. But considering they came from bats, they may not have had this parameter originally, the virus didn't have this parameter originally because the bats did not burst into flames. So it's sort of like an incompatible host sort of deal. So again, there are supernatural aspects to this movie, the timing of how quickly the virus infects, the bursting into flames from the heart stab, or the complete ashification of a vampire. But really, if the UV radiation damaged the cells to the point that they, they really would, they would just kind of burst, creating a more jelly-like mass as opposed to ash. And also, not being seen in the mirror, but being seen on camera. But hey, it's just fun to talk about what's actually possible concerning the biology. So the final thing we will discuss is the actual cure of these creatures. What is happening within them that makes this possible? Again, I think it all goes back to the functionality of the immune system and how the body reacts to the virus. At first, it is quickly overwhelmed by the virus and barely has time to react. However, what may be actually happening in the immune system is still very much active at this point. It's entirely possible that some of the virus is destroyed and brought to B cells by the dendritic cells, but when the blood stops, the method of getting antibodies across the meat suit stops. So the virus continues to run rampant, but it's entirely possible within the body the B cells are activated and have flooded the surrounding area with antibodies. But with nowhere to go, they just just sit and wait. For years, they are in a form of stasis as nothing is being broken down or cycled through. It's just sitting there waiting, just dormant, because the heart may have actually been stopped by extremely low serotonin levels. But once the heart is restarted by a blast from the sun and into cold water, this is enough stress to get the body jolted back into action, which may actually release these antibodies into the blood. As the antibodies are released, viruses are subdued, and with a functional immune system and the ability to go outside, the body may be satiated in terms of its need. 
needs. Now the issue is likely the vampire virus will permanently be in them as likely almost every cell they have has been infected and genetically changed, which could be a good thing and may provide again that form of immortality as their body now has vitamin D needed to survive and correct genetic damage. So after an infected consumes the blood of a cured, the antibodies enter their body much like the vitamin D with normal blood would. Topically, like what we have done with COVID recently, donating blood to those who have antibodies to the virus, to those who are sick to stop the virus from getting out of control in their own bodies. Using that line of thinking, this is what I believe the blood of the cured does to the vampire. It enters the body, attacks the virus, which may be actively subduing the action of the heart, and then freeing up the heart to begin beating once more. Of course, it's not so helpful if you are in a room full of starving vampires if you're turned back into human. To me, it all comes down to something as simple as nutritional needs that when it begins lacking creates a serotonin deficiency, genetic damage, and aggression within vampires that ultimately leads to the formation of a vampire's vampire known as a subsider. 